thank you all for coming. For those of you who are not part of the UC Berkeley community, um, classes ended today, uh, which is one of the reasons that there are not that many undergraduate students, especially here in the audience. They're all out having a last drink or whatever they are doing before they have to start studying for exams. Um, thank you for coming to this, uh, which is the last of the uh, poetry, Holloway Poetry Series events that the English Department at Berkeley presents every year in this room. Um, and I want especially to thank the English Department for making this room available for this event. Um, to thank Tom White, who has made the reception that will, or the refreshments that will be available at the intermission possible. To thank Tracy Grinnell, Michael Cross, and the many other people who have been working with Leslie's uh, archives, her papers, um, and making sure that people know about this extraordinary writer's work and enormous contributions to American and international poetry. Tracy has, has put up a, created a website with help of Michael Cross, Tom, and others, um, which I can't remember. Tracy, what's the address of it again? LeslieScalapino.com. LeslieScalapino.com. Um, it's really beautiful. Uh, part of it is there's some work in progress, um, which if you click on certain parts, like Leslie Scalapino's library is not yet cataloged, but all of that will be up there eventually. It's one of mo it's it's visually beautiful. Um, it's coherent. It's informative. It's very moving. Um, it's easy to use. It is a triumph of website design. So any of you who, who want um, an example of what to do, please go to lesliescalapino.com. I am assuming that almost everyone here in the audience knows who Leslie was um, and what her significance is. Um, but I just want to say a few, uh, gives a few facts um, for those of you who might not know. Um, Leslie Scalapino was born in 1944. Um, she died in May of this year. She lived mo much of her life in Berkeley. She and I went to the same grammar school, but she's a few years younger than I am. She was between my sister and my brother at John Muir School, which is on Claremont Avenue. Um, she didn't like it there. Um, she went to Reed College, where she was much happier, um, and then she came back to do PhD work at Berkeley and found it um, unacceptable in the extreme, um, and then embarked um, most seriously and without further distraction on a life so busy and so rich that nobody else could have lived it. She was a great writer of numerous books, some 30 books, enormously prolific writer in every conceivable genre, except I don't think she did any writing for uh, major Hollywood narrative films. <laughs> um, but she, she wrote plays, um, she wrote novels, she wrote uh, poetry, she wrote essays. Um, in addition to her writing, she was one of the major teachers in um, of of poetry and of poets, um, working at Mills College, at Bard College, at Naropa, um, and at several other places that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, her significance as a teacher um, is, is really unparalleled, um, and the, the clearest manifestation of that is the devotion that so many of her students have had for her when she was alive and continue to have for her now that she's no longer with us. Um, she was a, a major catalyst of original creative thought without ever being coercive. Um, no one writes like Leslie who has studied with her. Actually, I don't think anyone could write like Leslie, um, but they don't. Leslie uh, facilitated creative thought and creative work. She didn't. Uh, it, uh, prescribe it. She was a major publisher. Her O books um, published uh, numerous first works by emerging poets, numerous um, 
difficult works by established poets. Uh, the, the formats were uh, varied according to the book. Uh, she was an incredibly sensitive and appreciative and knowledgeable publisher. She was also a major editor. Um, putting together several anthologies under the O Books imprint, and also editing and publishing three or four anthologies, which were reflective of her and her co-editor, Judith Gold Goldman's um, activist aesthetic and commitment to social justice. Um, and those anthologies brought together work by an enormously diverse assortment of people addressing questions of war, um, social inequity, economic injustice, um, planetary depredation, um, et cetera. I'm not sure that she would ever have said that she stood to fight against um, the predations of late capitalism, but I will credit her with that noble task. Um, in retrospect. Um, this evening's program is full, um, and I hope everybody has a program. Um, if you don't, hopefully your neighbor will have one. Um, or if you raise your hand, um, my friend and the co-organizer of these Holloway events, Rosa Martinez, can. Is there anybody that needs a program? Yeah, OK. Um, all right, so there are a few people who are on the program who can't make it tonight. Um, I'm not going to introduce each person who's presenting work. I would ask each of them to identify themselves when they come to the podium. The evening will proceed as the program indicates. Um, Laura Moriarty cannot be here. Um, is someone, did she send? I'm reading it. Oh yeah, okay. Tracy Grinnell will read some work of Laura's. Um, Joanne Kiger cannot be here, and Cecil Giscom will make a few comments of his own and then read very short little uh, message and poem that Joanne Kiger sent. Judith Goldman made it to the airport and then realized she was too sick to travel further, so she is not able to be here um, tonight. Um, Alicia Cohen is not able to be here because her little boy is sick. So she's in Portland, is that where she lives? Yeah, she's home with her little boy in Portland. Um, the rest of us are here. Um, the evening will begin with an audio tape of Leslie reading from her work. Then I will come back and introduce myself again. I'm Lynn Higinian, by the way. Um, and then, uh, there will be, after Cecil Giscom reads in place of Joanne Kiger, there will be a film showing by Conrad Steiner. Then there will be an intermission, and everyone is invited to go out this door, turn right, and then left down the corridor. And at the end of that corridor, the door will be open, and uh, there are refreshments, um, Pellegrino and wine, and we'll take like a half hour intermission so everybody can be refreshed, and then we'll come back for the second half of the program. All right, so um, let's listen to Leslie Scalapino. This is from It's Go in Quiet Illumined Grassland. Silver half freezing in day, elation the outside of the outside sky walking rose. Silver half freezing in day, moon's elation of the outside rose, his seeing on both sides, seeing someone else at all, and the half freezing elation of the outside, so that's even with one, continually over and over one person. Standing, wall, wall, rose, and rose flowers, social, both. Conceptually as of dropping being or a view in space, as dropping out is not using language here either. Slow, which is one walking so slow that outraces, eludes them to walk so slowly as not to be there with them at all, who are social only, or outracing them 
ahead. Neither, yet one sight at a time, retains. A sight itself retains outside, and sight is only separate from language or movement. As dropping out low, vertical, night is both, with no people, but images seen at once, left there. No seeing, either. Is wild moon in day? A left there, as left leg. The viewer is in a separate place from what they see at the moment, always. The viewer is they, both, running. Wall is space. Yet people on the street seen at the waist, walking slowly. A bus moves in its middle. It's not relying on anything, even its sound there, though it is its sound only. Why? Its sound is not the sight. There, existing only constructed, just social only, are themselves. Can't see behavior evening, either. These are the same. I can't see at all. Is that occurrence? Both. Failed to see that a person in the past is what they are doing, are, and they aren't that, then and now, both. So I didn't learn, am outside. So seeing is space, then anything occurs. Oppression is the social space, then. Someone else in the social space goes for, to perceive what's occurring. The outside isn't fear. Then it isn't. She goes for the separation of seeing and being as it's occurring, its occurrence. Elation, the separation of sight and language there, the first time of the social space, is between sky, sky, at all, daily, evening, times, Comparing the mind to magnolias or to sky because one sees, but comparing people's actions to sky or to war, to moon outside, is in that space then apprehend behavior evening, ferocity even, from just one where there was no reason, bewildering, doesn't seem bewildering if it's huge in multitude, indentation so that they're even, one to evening, is no behavior evening, any event, a random space. On the present, wild friends are there only, yet not going away, either in the middle is their coming together, so red leaves see early rim in oneself, or just placed together to not do that. Then it's the disparate as rose outside one. Wall standing rose could just place together, as evening in the middle of people speaking, and so no space even there one, freezing pale night at wild only day, there only, no rose even so can place, the day there being no people speaking one. By one figure, evening, Enlightening, where there is no horizontal, only setting moon and sun at once. Axis abandoned the floating moon and sun. Pool of horses running on immense gold plain, but it is indigo sky. That's evening horses running in front of far reflecting water lying on the plain, pool where there, running, 
then on the floor in evening and lightning, I'm going to read some sections from a collaboration that Leslie and I began. Um, it's the second, was intended to be the second of five collaborations, one on each of the senses. Um, this one, we completed sight and that was published and this one um, is called Hearing. It's unfinished and probably will never be published. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit of that. Hearing, it's, there's, uh, after each passage, I will say initials LS for Leslie, LH for me, Lynn Hyginian. Hearing as only in the sound's beginning, occurrence, not memory. Hearing is state of bliss, I thought, because it is. They are run through the air as being not one. Then memory occurs in conversation, rungs of anger, as transmission nonstop at night in silence where within one the wild hell of voices only sounds that can't be stopped as they have been released in one. Hell recurs, yet also bliss. They aren't memory. They are then distortion of sound as if light years, temporal yet in permanence and so hell as one's imitation of others' movements to oneself, one not hearing movements, their transmitted becoming sound at night, sometimes. In Kyoto, the freezing clear sky transmitting, transmitting nothing impermanence waves, the huge crows rowing, not within the crying craw there a small child behind me, him at the age of just beginning to speak, begin hearing an utterly open craw as I was, lifted his face up to it and loudly transmitted the same craw, turning to verify to the woman by him from whom he's begun, LS. Sound is thrown to the winds, it is blissful, to hear at the moment of incipience, at the moment when it is first finally possible, thrown to crowded rooms, to splattered fields, to vortical patterns in the absolute dark between choruses. Hearing occurs as switching, i.e. becoming pertinent, occurs. In peddling, sound is peddled, and the sound thought speeds towards some emotionally crushed or crushing Margaret or Ivan or Alice, snapped sweeping in the early morning owls, in the early morning hours, when there's almost no traffic noise, none that one is consciously coiling into zero, i.e. stopping, canceling as upsetting experience or banal information. LH. Hearing as being the sound itself, as being itself the dark peddled, when there is not stopping it in one, in being impermanence. If sound is peddled, the dark a petal, traffic is sweeping in the early morning hours, the early not beginning anywhere. At least it isn't beginning there any more than in the sailing, weighing, open crow, rotting the inner cold, bright air as rotting or rowing are equidistant as sky only that space. The crow's a petal, therefore it's sound. What's the relation of cognition in identifying out man demon whose activity is that and hearing in one? There's a hole in the wall, but for this to be the case, the wall had to exist before the hole as hearing. Hearing occurs at the beginning, rowing at the wall, but again, rowing is ahead of the wall, and so on. I want to say it, rowing, hearing, wall is saved for the beginning, but that would be a future beginning and thus not correspond to what I intuit as bliss, which is real incipience of an entirely new thing, something unanticipated in the realm of hearing. Anticipation does, of course, occur. There is a waiting to hear, for example, of a report which is to be given to a person in doubt, 
But at the moment of actually hearing it, whether the report is good or bad, the hearing itself, as hearing, occurs in a moment of absolute freedom, utter deracination, floating, rowing wall, LH. Deracination is only hearing, bliss. Is one being in a state of space as hearing, pedal, as rowing wall? So it is only beginning, or it would be at the same time, hearing also. Pedal as rowing is at the same time as rowing. Past hearing in anticipation is only rowing wall future. Wall of crow rowing, yet hearing only the rowing, parts. Hearing the report parts, pedal wall as hearing. So whole as evening is in hearing. Oh, that's uh, LH. No, that's LS. And here's more LS. Um, tunnel, that's day and night, two to day and night. No language can describe two that are that tunnel. They are black and in day, which have sound, but without any language. So couldn't be one that could describe it, even that of the birds that do sing, but in the day and night are taken away from the elements that are a language, lifted out even of theirs, without it blue everywhere on the side. That's blackness and day. That's movement of the birds that from it blew throats at the side, through it. Now, now I can't, I had a one perfect little ending piece here. Sorry. Here it is. Truculence at hearing also, yet not at the image, as of listening in order to cross the horizontal ice plates in Antarctica, it seeing, one seeing, rather than hearing as quiet in someone speaking an account of it, a newborn then, one's hearing, isn't impinging anything. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Simon Fatal. Uh, here we are gathered around Leslie. The way the way we were gathered in her home with Tom, Leslie, one was one of the few among us whose house was always open, where all the poets could meet at the numerous parties, whether it was Christmas parties or book parties or just simple little parties. Anyway, I have the privilege of having published this wonderful last book of Leslie. Uh, I consider it a masterpiece. We cannot say it's her best work because that doesn't exist. One's writing is a continuum and Hers was an ascending line. So I will, and she was also a great supporter of my work as a sculptor. And I will read where our two works intersect. Sorry. No collective Baudelaire later, the ochlocracy. At sea, halving and having, time disappears the ocean, bitstream indigo horizon, pure, whole, unbroken, sight seeing it. Days of spring airs the xocropy, as liquid elation is happiness, felt in the distaff's throat. 
the people use the Twitter feeds to mobilize protests. Now individuals protesting are crushed, imprisoned, murdered. Happiness sees and hurts the weather out in the midst of the ochlocracy. The mobs all crowd chosen, the exarch. Who's to speak for the family? Family occur. Fox P2 gene has no language faculty that this stuffer thinks. A Gatling gun mounted in a helicopter, Castropodus hurtling, copter sagging through the air of the tundra plain. Flying, firing from it, Sarah Palin, former candidate, running mate of the then, then presidential candidate, mows down the floating moose herds that come up beneath her. It plays, reveals its family occur, redundant, is laughing snide at the young isolate, not ever at the outside, created in isolation. Ocus, its sister, always is its alleviator, whose speaking adjusts for him it as they shop as they walk. There are no signs of civilization in either sibling, though somehow they exist in the hollow shell of the animate structures in the crowd as archiphenomens. The sister is to the ochre, one having a quality abducent in the other as pairs, omission of dawn at evening, while dawn is in the other midnight, with asterism sparkling, moving clear, still at once at sea, halving time, disappears the ocean. Bit stream, indigo, horizon, pure, whole, unbroken sight, and seeing it. The sleek reddish brown moose running in that dawn, floating up under her sights, the helicopter wallowing in the air, where Sarah Pellin, running mate to the candidate, continuous, is firing revolving clusters, the Gatling gun's bullets spray at once, their gastrolas dying inside them when the mothers fall in the running herds. The occult choosing, too, would change, then everything would. Innocent discover things for Utop futures utopian. Even the sister of the ochre chosen as exact Fox P2 is made oral deputy, thinks discover incredulous. Or thinks the sister stronger than the ochre. So the sister sees at once with doing it, flattering him. With all of the family working to ensure he never sees his reflection, or he would, what? Salk oscillograph dissilient? That open would occur in what? The crumbling moves, jejunum opening a new passage when one living creature hit from above as running mate Sarah Pellings firing from the helicopter. If there's no collective boiler later, the ochres, the ochres dorsal is twitching where red blood pumps dawn visible in his hump. Beside it, the aquano dorkish swimming in the oscillating universe, infinitely governed by the mob. No one really, the corporations, always the ochre wiped with dozens, yet the aquanaut is oclophobic. As such, he even keeps it going. The infantine adult ochre distortion, but aquanaut swimming in the ocean, the seasons visible there to the aquanaut decrotic, hairs the plum inserted, dark, liquid, flooding, night air, plugging, dawn, asterism flows there, beneath these stars, limbs a huge oak tree on land, appear still while it is moving. The tree plum of sky, aquanaut, swims. Walk in the underground petroleum and emerge black. Visual and word was then second. Simon Fatal, visual after and first, is said by Etel Adnan, from word to constant sight, is outside separate. Thank you. Well, can you hear okay? 
All the way back? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, selected poems will be appearing from the University of California Press uh, the 15th of next month. And the reason I'm bringing that up right now is that book was edited by Leslie Scalapino, and as well as the editing of it, which did a wonderful thing for me. It freed me from myself, from all the heavy armatures and heavy duty pictures of myself that I carried around and presented a selection of my poems that I truly love, and I think really is me, uh, without uh, all the preconceptions of it. And her introduction to it is a, a beautiful and profound thing to me, and I think it will be to many who read it. And I see the editor, the, the UC Press editor of the book, Rachel Burston, here too, and I want to thank her also. Thank you, Rachel, from both of us. And uh, this means that the last couple of years of uh, Leslie's life, uh, Amy and I spent a lot of time with uh, Tom White and with Leslie uh, during the editing of that. And it's a very deep and rich and meaningful period, a, a part, not a period, part of my life. And um, my reading of Leslie's work is a lyrical passage from Zither. I wanted to read it aloud each time I saw it in its go in horizontal. I wish, after hearing Leslie's audio tape at the beginning of this, that she was here to read it to you and for me to hear, because I cannot do justice to this beautiful piece of writing. Um, uh, like all of Zither, it's rich in Leslie's myriad-mindedness and in her imagination chasing inspiration and in inspira her inspiration pursuing Im her imagination. Uh, it's pure as mulberry sugar and soft as moss and crystals. So, and then after that I'm going to read some haikus. from Zither. <clears throat> Lear is the viewer. One might even loosen this faculty, sensual as exterior, interior at once, of apprehension further from one's stream. Zither is the rewriting of King Lear as Kurosawa's Ran, which doesn't have this in it. A little white owl springs up gliding toward one. A girl with eyebrows curved like bows follows it into the plumed grass. The moon or sun resting on the plumed grass, both then walk on plumed grass. Horse, down crowds coming in from the long plumes, eyebrows arch following phosphorescent owl gliding in. In fireflies, crowds sides running on its sides. Crowds running on its sides wallows on black grass. Crowds wallow eyebrows on moon-edged horse blackness. Crowds wallow grass horse gliding moon. Eyebrows wallow crowd on the horse. The man at the cafe outside in the light appears to be wearing a magpie's glistening black feathers glistening blackness. Crowd comes in plume grass to little white owl. Head in blackness and running legs in plumed grass. Seated royals in sun and moon, both then and half plumed wall grass. Crowded in sun and moon, both then wallows on wall plumes and seated to the side the half. Horse, alone, walking beside man, who seated at cafe in glistening black wall to plumed grass glass crowd. As freedom in rickshaws, early freedom, Ocean ball in future span sky is in. Two at all ones, two, starting out in rickshaws, no supervision then in the city. 
early freedom leading to blossomed spring. Separation is one leading to bud. Has no authority existing at all is only so it's not itself even. Children insulted in racially school to their early freedom, nothing is based on anything. One exists now on only the past to present as nothing, as that being in fact events since placing the past at present is dissolved. Humiliating children regarding their race until they stamped and screamed, then they did so, the adults got out of the way, the realignment by present adult didn't work, were not past. To change the past at present, no need. So <clears throat> here's a group of haikus for Tom and for Leslie. Some of them are for Tom, some of them are for Leslie, and some of them are for Tom and Leslie. The first two I'm going to read, called The Mystery of the Hunt, are for Tom and Leslie. And they're a memory of the field front yard in Point Arena with gophers and bobcats. For Tom and Leslie. Looking, looking up, the gopher sees sunlight in the bobcat's eyes. Claw-fringed paw hangs exquisitely still. No twitch. Wham! These are all kind of point arena haiku. Sky meat peeping through blue, gray, black at wave crash. Lush ripples. Black, new moon, star clouds, halos. Flashlight shines in small yellow eyes. My face is a rock lumped with moss, crusty lichens, small red leaves. My moss head Tiny red maple leaves and lichens makes light. Gut twisting beauty of science journals on shining pages. Dressed in strange skin and soul making just the beings on wet beach rocks. I want to read that again. That's too good to read once. Dressed in strange skin and soul making, just the beings on wet beach rocks. Last one. The happy white dog with black eyes Rolls in deer shit. <laughs> Wave crash nearby. Thank you. I'm so happy to see everyone here tonight. 
Before I uh, read from Liz Please's book, her detective Use book. Mine. Well, yeah. Oh, okay. Can you hear, hear me yeah, now? Okay, I'm, before I read from Leslie's book, Orchid Jet, Jetson, I'm going to read part of an email that I got yesterday from Marina Adams, who was a, a, a collaborator with Leslie on Among other things, her book, The Tango, beautiful Granary Press book. We were talking on email because uh, she was planning to come but couldn't make it. made it to Leslie's play performed here in New York, New York at Dixon Place. The play was really good. So Leslie, she so got it done. The rhythm, the chaos, the clarity, in the impossible flow of thinking put into language. I kept wondering how it would, could end, it, as it felt so timeless, so rhythmically endless, but she did it. She somehow brought it to a crescendo, a finale, a beautiful closure. That's what I was, would say if I was there. All love, Verena. And this is her detective book, written as D. Goda. And I'm going to read it around in the book. The rain and hearing the rain quieted her. Whatever glided by, one glided by through it, is outside the rain falling silently, straight falling of the city. The land isn't lit except being in falling rain. Only when the rain is falling silently are they there. The land isn't lit, it's in falling lit rain. A sailor on a freighter having drunk too much by himself, fallen overboard, the ship going on with no one seeing him mid, in mid-ocean at night, said a tortoise there sustained him all night and into the day until a freighter passed, picking him up. The tortoise's legs are oars. Under the black sky and the black ocean, yet without any tortoise, the black horizon of eventless black ocean and black sky different. Different also in the Arctic Ocean's horizon and ocean and Indian Ocean's black horizon and black ocean. At that moment, that black sky and ocean being distinguished from each other there. The moon was on his head. This work was written while traveling. Then, seated at Venticello's, the doors open onto Jones Street, the trolley tracks 
embedded in the steep street in the balmy, warm air of an Indian summer that is evening light, friends seated. And I think about that time, Tom, when you and Leslie and Aaron Sheeran and I were at Venti Tellers, I like to think about that particular time reading this. So many wonderful dinners. It's early heat walking, no clouds above. The parasol illuminates. One barely remembers a dream now at the parasol on hill shining not from clouds. The dream something completely different. Action is not what anyone says. The content of conversation isn't its subject. It's vast backlog of action occurring People don't even listen to each other. Two people in conversation to speak at the same time, or one cuts off the other to stop that for person from saying what they perceive out of various motives. Conversation doesn't hold anything well pleasurable, so one can be moving in it with no barrier. A vast land, silent, active realm that has no verbal transgression. Trying to get to or to see where actions separate from their social existence, which is what they are, that is their connotative being. So seeing an action without that. One is not oneself, but is some other person, such as one's father, existing alive at the same time. One is nothing in oneself, in being only them, that person. But that is merely something unknown, real. You can put all the hopeful things first, and then they don't occur. Whereas if you put them at the end, they appear to occur, but don't. What's your point? They appear to happen first. Yesterday, Toshiro Mifuni died, I read today. He was born in China in 1920 and repatriated to Japan in 1946. Following his samurai movies from a young age, influenced by them, I thought he is myself. The horses in the sugar cane, their tails in the strong wind, shooting and whirling there. Thank you. I'm Tracy Grinnell. Um, as Lynn mentioned, Laura Moriarty is unable to be here tonight, so I'm going to read a short poem that Laura sent me to, um, for Leslie, that she wrote for Leslie. Quiet morning. I keep a bowl of gardenias by the Quan Yin, though magnolia was her flower, on my steps, or her house where, in ordinary life, last but once, I saw her alive. We had tea and sweets, stuffed with bean paste. Years gone by, following pleasure, 
Wherever it worked, we had tea again, and she by then, only angel food and determination, would live still, but wildly, if she could. This is so wonderful to see all these people and hear Leslie's voice and her work in so many of these amazing voices. Um, I, one of the first times I spent time with Leslie, she had invited me to be a visiting writer in her class at the San Francisco Art Institute. And um, what's so memorable about that experience was her tremendously generous and capacious way of engaging with all of these different students' writings and her ability to sort of just move in inside of their work and live there with them and share that with them. And just her, her ability to really take things on their own terms. And so I was going to read tonight from How Phenomena Appear to Unfold, Leslie writing about her own work, Leslie in her own terms. Um, and I'm going to read the section entitled Note on My Writing. And this section begins with um, two segments from her work that they were on at the beach aleotropic series. The ship so it's in the foreground, with the man who's the beggar in back of it. The soil is in back of him, is active. So it's mechanical. There aren't other people's actions. I don't know how old the man in back is, who's older than I desired been had by him for something else. I am not old. And with him being inactive back then. Playing ball, so it's like paradise, not because it's in the past, we're on a field. We are creamed by the girls who get together on the other team. They're nubile, but in age they're 13 or so, so they're strong. No one knows each other, aligning according to race as it happens, the color of the girls and our being creamed in the foreground. As part of its being that, the net is behind us. I intended this work to be the repetition of historically real events, the writing of which punches a hole in reality, as if to void them, but actively. Also, to know what an event is. An event isn't anything. It isn't a person. No events occur. Because they are in the past, they don't exist. Conversely, as there is no commentary external to the events, the children on the playing field can commune with each other. It's entirely from the inside out. There was, when writing the book, something else occurring besides what's going on in the segments, but the events do not represent that. A segment in the book is the actual act or event itself, occurring long after it occurred, or acts put into it, which occurred more recently, they somehow come up as the same sound pattern. The self is unraveled as an example in investigating particular historical events, which are potentially infinite. The self is a guinea pig. The piece in That They Were at the Beach titled A Sequence is erotica a genre being artificial, which can comment on itself as a surface because it is without external commentary. External commentary does not exist as it's being entirely erotica genre, which is what? By its nature as erotica genre, it is conventional, though it may not have people's character or appear to be social convention, nor does there appear to be domination. In a Godard film such as Hail Mary, one doesn't know whether it is just its surface or it is from the inside out. Similarly, in a sequence, the surfaces 
is, are the same. The camera lens of writing is the split between oneself and reality. Which one sees first, view of dying and life, is inside, looking out into untroubled experience, which is the beggar who's lying back from the dock in the above example, so that repression would not be a way of giving depth. Chameleon series in that they were at the beach are multiple cartoons, distortions of the inner life, excuse me, the inner self, which have a slight quality of refined medieval songs. Interpreting phenomena is deciphering one's view. This is related to poems, which are cartoons or writings, which uses the genre of comic books as commentary being the surface. The form has objective quality of life, i.e. the comic book from which life is excluded, has freedom in the actions of the characters. Thank you. I'm Cecil Giskin. I teach poetry uh, here at, uh, at UC, UC Berkeley. I'm standing in for Joanne Kiger, a writer whose work I, I very much admire. Joanne couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't make it. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, the material that she, that she sent. But first, I'm, I'm going to say that I came to Leslie's, to Leslie Scalapino's work uh, in 1982 or 1983. I was an editor then at Cornell University. And um, I, I read the work, I believe, in Sulphur, in Sulphur magazine, and I was terribly, terribly excited, excited by it. Leslie and I corresponded. Uh, she lived on Clover Street or Clover Avenue in, in Oakland at that, at that time. I still recall the, uh, her handwriting on the, on the envelopes. Uh, we, we corresponded. I published uh, her work uh, in Epic, this magazine. Um, on, on a, couple, a couple of occasions and got her to Cornell for uh, an incredible reading at the Annabelle Taylor Hall in 19, 1985. Oddly enough, the, the, uh, the poem that, uh, that uh, Jocelyn just read from, That They Were at the Beach, was the, uh, that was the sequence I, that we published in this, this issue. And I remember reading it in manuscript on, at my desk and feeling incredibly lucky. Her work since then, since uh, I first encountered it in the, in the 1980s, has been incredibly meaningful and incredibly powerful to me as a reader and as a, a poet. Um, and this is the, uh, the letter and the poem from, uh, from Joanne Kiger. Somewhere in the 70s, Joanne writes, Larry Carney and Richard Durden brought Leslie over to my garden for our first meeting. They introduced her by saying, this is Leslie Scalapino, and she's the best poet west of the Rockies. <laughs> or maybe they said, the best woman poet in the world. She gave a small smile in acknowledgment of this heritage. We immediately sat on the grass, and I gazed at her in wonder. She looked so young. Her hair was so perfect. A sweet voice, but she hardly spoke. Soon after, a singular book by her arrived from Sand Dollar Books, The Woman Who Could Read the Mind of Dogs. Oh, I thought, that's me. <laughs> I was born in the year of the dog. That's why she gazed at me so peacefully while I rambled on and on. <laughs> and Joanne Kiger's poem, Seeing the Scenery. Satisfied this morning because I saw myself for the first time in the mirror as a mountain. I mean by this, I saw the scenery in myself. Whereas I had pores and veins and a brain, I was a mountain in the same way one has boulders or trees. How would this explain, I wondered, whatever emotions such as affection, cruelty, or indifference I feel? And I knew no matter how careful one is, 
pebbles and grains will be modified, put in human form. Thank you. Hello. Um, oh, it's wonderful. This, I have not been looking back. It's so great to see a full house. My name is Conrad Steiner. Um, I, my association with Leslie began in 1999 when I wrote her a letter asking if she would let me film a book of hers. And um, I'm going to show you a segment, the latest piece that I've done from that uh, sequence of films tonight in a minute. The book is Way. Some of you may have seen the pieces before. There are six sections. Um, I've completed now five of them. And I'm very, very happy to be able to show it to you because I feel like um, it's an expression of the work that uh, can still, the, the conversations that Leslie is still having with me and I'm sure many people here. Um, our collaboration isn't over yet. I still have one more film to do. <laughs> um, and I guess I can think of a thousand other um, occasions that I would rather be showing this at that Leslie was in the audience. But um, I'm actually very happy to be able to screen this for the first time for all of you who know her work so well. And um, I'm glad to share it with you. So thank you. Hoofer, the woman who's not arrested on the bus from banging the seat, any change not occurring and seen as irrelevant in relation to her, and not just that, in the world. The woman banging on the seat as not in a situation, manufacturing, continuing, the driver of the bus isn't able to do it that way making the others get off, the flesh being fragile, my falling down on some stairs to a sidewalk, again from bad heels of shoes, but this time more violently than the previous episode in the soft flesh of my back being hurt, learning it seems silly to accept the authority or want it of some situation of needed and sought after instruction as destroying, not of the hurt back in my falling, which had not been done in that way, but of fragile flesh and not in a situation of authority. When it is performance, not of our culture, the flesh being fragile and not hurt, in the women being licked between their legs by the men, but who are customers or who are not that, but aren't socially important or ordinary. They're being ordinary as the attractive feature of the men and women, and they're being licked between their legs, though it may not be commercial, but for the flesh being fragile and not hurt. The man, though, thinking of the women's feelings in regard to passing by the booths of customers and allowing them to lean out and lick between their legs as part of their performance as if it were not or is in the commercial setting, but after that, and the woman caressed between the legs by the man, they're both not being socially important as the conjunction of the flesh being fragile in that episode. So there would be just an excuse for this and not a real reason manufacturing as the substantive or determination from it, close to being the episode from the a man having licked the woman's middle, that is, between her legs, not then, puritanical as not having a thing to do with it, the flesh having been, being fragile, not from that. They don't like the life of the bum as fragile, though not for that reason, from commercial, their being in the bar, who are bartender and waitress, 
So the bartender and waitress in the bar, not liking that was the bum, or that is it, so that it's reversed as the same bum as fragile, and got the bartender and waitress angry in the mere conversation about the bum's existence, which is fragile, not from that on their part. So it's turned out, which may be a or the bums, the same as not from that existence, unfortunately, as they're not socially important or are ordinary to communicate regardless and to know that will not be naive from their existence or mine as a silly view of it, manufacturing, Fred Astaire, a hoofer, as the reason or that from his existence of our culture to communicate, not from it manufacturing. The positive event, therefore, as the episode from it being that of Fred Astaire, hoofer, as resulting or flowering of the bum, second part, to suck on the man's part, now between the legs, there in bed, so not in or after the commercial setting, the job deliberately, which is out of necessity of low, as if it were hoofer and learning standing so held for a silly reason, the in bed sweet smell of the man as being not whose nude of Fred Astaire's positive event and so flowering for that reason and a job of some stupid sort as being not of the commercial setting or from that after it and of the positive event of the low work to throw out the bums as meaning flowering the president being what oneself is or in a job as the individual person the relation with from outside the bums or women viewed as not subject to change that as irrelevant, but which really occurs that way as conservative, the interior of the relation of the vums or men to each other viewed as irrelevant or being so in society as being conservative inherently suffocating the reverse of that as not subject to change. The relation of them to each other viewed as irrelevant in society, yet that occurring any way out in doing the same when that happens. The woman will then change who'd been banging the seat on the bus, not arrested or if she had been seen as irrelevant to them, as fragile, quiet, though not the woman on the bus, when that is seen by people, her or as doing this from hurt or of oneself may be, and in the setting as conservative for it to be derivative, there or myself it may be calm of society doing this but as the relation with people only existing as the reverse as that as it occurs the men being rowdy a couple of them as the same as that characteristic objecting in the situation of the women performing the one whipping the other in front of the customers a couple of whom get rowdy in the juncture of their being loaded irrelevant to be calm to put out that for it to be derivative as the reverse of that expression whether the people are loaded or not getting rowdy, but in the juncture of the setting being derivative, though they may be the men who are young or women, and that juncture as the same, having to be put out.
Um, thank you, Lynn <laughs> and Rosa. Thank you, Tom, for making this possible, for pulling it all together. It's really happy to be able to be here tonight. Um, when I first heard Leslie Reed at Mills College 15 years ago, I was completely captivated and undone by her writing. I had not yet read her work on the page, and I remember leaving the room in a sort of linguistic euphoria, amid floating silk black irises and pulsing thoraxes, suddenly feeling the words as part of my own body, inside and outside collapsing into one another, infinite intersections of infinite actualities that I grasped as reality. Walking out into the world, I experienced a hypersaturation of everything. The grass, the sky, the people, the physical space I was in equaled the reverberations of irises and thoraxes, everything rebelling against their categories, these imposed separations. I immediately signed up for her writing workshop, and Leslie became my teacher, my publisher, um, a collaborator, and a friend. I believe Leslie was reading from New Time at Mills 15 years ago. <clears throat> so that's what I'm going to read from tonight. Not at one's frame or at existing, while though pressure is in it, is it the physical frame only. Interpretive is the fixing, and as such distortion of phenomenal activity per se, not simply fixing the view of actions. An outside, outwardly articulating social interpretation which qualitatively changes the object of its consideration, as does the inner warp which warps in order to see its own reverberation, is there. Silk black iris, that's chest, thorax, lifted off, set down, weighing. It doesn't come from them, is lifted off, breathing, outside of one. That is, one, weighed, not in the air. It is in the air, thorax, black, silk, iris, not image, breathing, in the air, yet weighed, Weighed is it being lifted off, the frame weighed, it in the air. Black of night isn't dependent. At black dawn, in fact, an ocean of black irises hanging in darkness of where one sits, so was sewing them. Up at 3 a.m. in silence, sewing, so silk black irises that are that, the folds. We don't have words. The silk black iris, formation later, but then outside of my chest, thorax, lifted off one's haunches, is not the conception of the silk black iris, though was it in lifting off. Itself, that it's formed first, I'd have to not want it in writing to give up living. Notion that it's possible to insert this later as chronology later is in the black thorax lifted off breathing, sewing the irises later. Not while sewing them, but in the silk black thorax lifted off later, iris, as the physical body, then occurs only. If the nature of this is struggling wall of birds flying that aren't on their own, if we're not going to do this with people, there isn't any existence. I'm relieved by the wall of birds. One is, in fact, struggling and not with one's, their existence. It is a fact. This is a light relief. Floating rib cage on the bare feet in the pouring snow is inner, prior or young when not. Social, being, can then be in the two countries where one is. The struggle has to not redo itself, as it is the same minute shape as itself. 
has to do itself at the time of struggle, yet not at the time of resting in snow. To see there what you had, chronologically, otherwise one was transgressing it. Now it is transgressing it. The adamant social being, oneself, will never be, was never, in the dark night or the dawn, while running to the rise. One would be taken away from oneself in not being, seeing, continual change, dawn, land isn't one, is land, living, to redo the break, that's dawn, per se. <clears throat> the conflict can't be articulated again, redoing dawn by people. It isn't itself then. Fighting is redoing dawn. Logic is in reverse, aside. A man's view that dawn is convention itself as harmony, taking it back into one. Harmony has to be in reverse here, drives one outside of oneself. Rebelling is only there as being minute struggle itself. <clears throat> Reduction of traveling where one has nothing is nothing. A nomadism is a bright wind in bird life of people only. This is the same as reduction to convention, where it doesn't exist even, as being, traveling, only, not existing. It blows apart. Wild gap of dawn, not it. Not so much the particular interpretation of events, but as that it happens at all. Filled events catalyzed in one as physical gap tormenting is itself the break that's the dawn, in fact. Break, expanded, that are going on. Red flamed trees, leaves, sea, is the occurrence outside. Past has to be only an act that's only in present standing, walking. Waves of the thousands, huge crows in freezing sky at dawn, from loaded, they're jostling in, tree by me, night only, but only a single arbitrary event in present now, walking, thin blue sky, to be pressure on, present, one. The pressure of the choked, thick night in one, single past event and thin present sky. The voluptuous, choked, thick, on night, can't breathe. The hundreds of huge, slightly moving, choked only at night, only is fear. Single crows loading tree by thin wall of one at night, their dawn as realigning present dawn, only one could give up as their dawn is thin blue of one. Thank you. And, um, Judith Goldman couldn't be here either tonight, um, and M. Mara Ann is going to read on her behalf. So I'm really honored to read this piece for Judith, so I will try to do it in the utmost spirit of all that is glorious about Judith Goldman. So it'll be in the first person. I'll start by saying that I miss Leslie immeasurably much in the last week, as I planned my visit here, I repeatedly marked out a day for us to spend time together, forced to realize as I went to email her each time that I was coming here because she was not here anymore. Leslie was a very good friend and mentor to me, 
and I continue to admire her courage and conviction, her radically inventive autonomy, her sensitivity, openness, and generosity more than I can say. Leslie and I published a draft of what I think may have been the first piece she wrote of her penultimate novel, Floats Horse Floats or Horse Floats in War and Peace. I remember, although it happened yesterday, as if it happened yesterday, being at her house and the beautiful smile she had on her face, really pleased with herself, telling me about the new writing she was doing for the Times article on Venus Williams' deconstructed backhand. <laughs> when I finally felt able to read Horse Floats and Dihedron's Gazelle, Dihedral Zoom, I immediately was infatuated. As Leslie explains, she composed these works through Alexia by using a dictionary to come across random words unknown to her, which she then used to generate infinitely dimensional narrative characters. These intersect with references to people and phenomena of the outside world, particularly recent violent political events and subaltern figures, as well as with discussions of nonlinear time, physics, and writing in sentences of griffin like syntactic structure and an extraordinarily sonic interest in beauty. I'm going to read parts of a piece I wrote heavily under the influence of these forceful works in homage to Leslie. And this is from Judith. The one actress was but just danced around by Fred in one number. She, it, didn't dance while Fred leans into the turn of the room and makes the transition he danced with a cane, a chair, could dance with a newel post supporting the handrail of a stair, and Rogers in the Nurwal, an arctic animal with spiraling grooved tusk. The nevis, a birthmark, made her nervous. The one actress was tapping almost a marionette. Athletic, not sexual, astral Fred asked her asteroids predator hinged the topper, his foot tweets, chopping. Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, whose placement separates the above scenarios from a central event against the fever. Protesters dug a trench as peacekeepers responded with fire, knickerbocker, a barrage of bottles, rocks, cholera, barcoded back in August. His ability to dance with his whole body in tent cities in a slum? Peacekeepers responded with fire. Their truck fell in the trenches, bottles, rocks, cacophony. Barricades made of coffins with cholera victims inside made her nervous or giving them microloans after they judged the project. Food at a warehouse was looted and burned. A child fishes on a bench coveted, covered with rubbish. Spreading faster? dancing around a room, so it appeared he was dancing on the walls against the fever and then upside down, on the ceiling in a slum behind the picture plane as if. As if looking out a window, Fred stares at Ginger, totters a special set attached to a giant motor barricade every couple hundred yards. First stage removal. Streets prohibited to non-permits in one hour. Use buildings as ruse. The pallid bat, Yuma mitosis, prolapsing to another now, hurrying and splashing the mud of the building's alarm system in the curve of the door which would unfold. The punk burglarizing his apartment, seated with her back against a tree and legs raised onto the shoulders of a younger boy. Imagine that there is a balloon which is to produce this sound by focusing on making the sound stable as if to mimic the action of a baby. The two parent colors large than a ch the two parent colors larger than the children or middle hues, nates or buttocks necessary, increasing the appetite for risk. Negative amateuration used by Cezanne to break passage in terms of pure value, as when the diagonal forward slash strip in the negative space behind the table breaks into a table. When red and green are combined, yellow is created. When green and blue are combined, cyan and the bank consortium. If they are placed close to each other, domestic workers garb form a chain of suckling mouths to breast, subprime complaining about the trash from illegals or eagles drop off, considering it littering, or if an animal drops trash, coyote carrying them, collecting the plastic bags, gallon water jugs in the desert, wearing a surgical mask because of the air. 
Einstein felt the animated cartoon provided an idiom where Disney could implant the principle of totemism. Walking is referred to as carrying the cocker spaniel. It is important acting skill. Because Einstein says how easily and graceful these four fingers on both of Mickey's hands playing a Hawaiian guitar whereby man and animal are identical and the subject and object. The back of the knee of the hind leg needs to be stretched to hold the weight while the Spanish stays in contact with the floor. Lifting simply eases the weight transfer, spanner. As if the transfer is made swiftly, the front part of the spaniel does not lift at all. Einstein saw the animated cartoon to be like a direct embodiment of the method of animism. The two middle fingers become little legs, the two outer fingers little hands. The second hand becomes its partner. He had his arms outstretched, wetting himself through the bandages, almost a marionette, seated with her back against a tree and legs raised onto the shoulders. When Fred had his arms outstretched where he, when he was dancing, would bend his two middle fingers towards his palm because he thought his hands were too big. Suddenly there are no longer two hands, but two funny little white people elegantly dancing together along the strings of the Hawaiian guitar. Stuffing the other people into himself a second or third time, the second hand becomes its partner. The weight of the body remains on the hind leg while one foot slides forward. Einstein equated animism with fire, Disney's liberty to create infinite movement and form. So it appeared as he was dancing up the walls. The front of the forward foot lifts while its heel stays in contact with the floor. Tragus, the appendage at the base of the ear. Color is always being seen in relation to the colors surrounded by it. Neodymium for coloring glass. Carotid artery desert caravan, almost impossible to see a color by itself. Enchiridion. In the tree cavity, there is a balloon full of air and even exhalation followed by a pause. Yawning, the body gets confused with the different amount of air coming in. The stomach should move naturally inward, hauled out of the cell, and their organs will be removed. The special set was attached to a giant motor which turned the room while being egged on by a female playmate. Look at those strong men, Falun Gong blood testing. Their organs will be harvested. When the room rig was unlocked from a docked position, streets hemorrhage, trembler, a body pallet falsies, Mumbly peg, a children's game played with a pocket knife which is tossed point first into the ground. The play B-sides. By then, these practitioners are half dead. The next day, they are hauled out of the cell organ brokering. Transplant tourism from Taiwan to China in China labor camps, who wields an ax backwards over the head. The stomach should not be sucked in as it prevents objects mounted in place and or replaced with stuck versions of them. Where a color moves into another color dancing up the walls and then just produce this sound, the veteran inmates told him, look at those strong men. They build a special set that was attached to a giant motor peeling her off of it and then upside down on the ceiling in the manner of shaving a piece of wood with a plane. Imagine that there is a balloon, a cocker spaniel, a plinth, but not sequential. The fur separated in soft shocks, building into the airliner door. The front part of the foot does not move at all. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Norman Fisher. <clears throat> Can you hear? Okay. Yeah. Uh, wonderful to hear Leslie's voice, huh? Uh, and the film with the pulsing images uh, in rhyme with the voice. It's kind of startling. A uh, little, little overwhelming. Yeah. And uh, the thing about it that is so impressive is that 
It's so clear and so full of conviction. Do you feel that? Every word that she says, that she writes, and it comes across on the page, although differently, every word is really true and really important. And there's such conviction at every point. And she was like that all the time, personally as well. And sometimes you, at least I could say, maybe some of you would feel the same way, I didn't exactly know what she was getting at, but it didn't matter because the most important thing was this sense of conviction and caring, right? She just cared so much about everything uh, that she was writing, and there was no difference between what she was writing and the, the rest of the world that was in such turmoil. Um, I had a lot to do with Leslie because we were very, both of us, very devoted to uh, Philip Whalen. Uh, when he was alive and when he was ill. We both uh, spent a lot of time with him, taking care of him. And after he passed on, we were taking care of his legacy and so on. So we had many adventures and controversies over this. And um, then we were also uh, worked together on the Poets in Need uh, board that, that Lynn is also on. And uh, so we, we had many things to talk about over the years. And um, I would talk to her on the phone sometimes, and I would say, so how are you? How's your, how's your pain, your chronic pain? She had a lot of pain, you know, well, most of the time for the last more than 20 years, I guess. And uh, always hoping she would say, oh, it's much better. You know, but she never said it's much better. It was never much better. It was always worse. And she would say so, and then she would laugh in this very odd way that was very joyful. And uh, it made you scratch your head like, what kind of a person is it who says it's much worse and then laughs <laughs> joyfully? But after a while, you got used to that. And it seemed to be uh, part of her you know, essential character that she could have joy you know, in the midst of because her writing is full of like the most horrible things, right? <laughs> the most horrible things. But it, also, there's a lot of joy in it at the same time. A lot of joy in it, and it just rolls right on. It could be something horrible or not, but it rolls right on, and she rolled right on. So I want to read um, a little bit from the beginning of um, Dihedron's Gazelle, Dihedral Zoom that Simone also read from and Simone published. She explains this work in um, an author's note at the beginning, and I'll read just a little bit of the author's note in, in the first section or two. It's, it's sort of in the same mode as horse floats, which seems to me to be a bizarre novel that has about seven or 77 stories going on simultaneously, many of which appear in every sentence. So in other words, one sentence might have several of the scenarios from, that's what it looks like to me, I, I can't tell exactly, but it's a, the most amazing uh, mode of writing I've ever seen. And I think somebody said that she was very pleased with it uh, when she uh, was, uh, had, had published it. So she explains here, in case you didn't understand, this is the explanation. Dihedrons and gazelle dihedrals are human-like creatures. Profoundly injured, they roam jetting space in the form of vertical severed halves. The dihedrons gazelle dihedral zoom was written by leafing through Random House Webster's unabridged dictionary choosing words by process of Alexia, as was mentioned. Uh, not as mental disorder, but word blindness, uh, trance-like stream overriding meaning, choice, and inhibition. The intention to bring about an unknown future was changed by this action of Alexia, making, as it happens, sensual, exquisite corpses, leading to the discovery that there isn't any future, isn't even any present. 
Now, what does she mean by that? <laughs> and you know what? She really means this, right? I mean, this is throughout her entire corpus of work. She says stuff like this all the time, and she really means it. She read too much Dogen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Too much Dogen, yeah. Uh, such an exquisite corpse read is in an instant, yet not even in a present. Outsides events unite, gluing to each other a single object. That which had already existed is by chance. De safia, as if the people can have no sensations, the writing becomes the sensations that are then felt by everything. And I think that uh, that it really is the explanation for what she's doing, not only in this work, but throughout. And, and, and it is true that she was really influenced by reading Dogen. It's true. And not, not many people realize she was actually practicing uh, meditation and Zen for a long time. It so happened that there was a, an official Japanese Zen temple around the block from her house that she walked to and practiced there. And we often talked about this. And I recognize from my own writing and my own practice of Buddhism so many of the themes that appear in her work. So this is the first section. The contester. The contester reaches the red chela into the streaming crowd, chela form extracting the dark blue poppies. Walking, one saw a dark blue poppy and seen one night. The two trembling part. Day begins anywhere. A forest on many stems rushes a single tree on stem. One had realized the small boys kidnapped sold to later wait on the kidnappers' parents when they're old, the boys are slaves too, as are the orphan girls. Girls are defined as those not killed. The word girl erased for others. They'd rather kill all blank girls, hands, motions are dactylology, and kidnap and enslave all boys then change. The family ochre, redundant, doesn't even remember, or doesn't remember at all, two entirely different events. But memory isn't the origin of events. Neither is. The I is not. Or, O-A-R. The hand thrust in, the red claw, the mitt, reaching the poppies, some red-centered, had performed actions, though the action is the contesters, already passed, but appearing at once, allowing the single petal outside not producing or attached in wind. Outside isn't either. The trees, fractionators, future only. A forest, two states, a tree rushes, a thousand trees roiling divided are in that sense two frothing the appendages bats, bat the sky, corners of the diamond in which the base runner runs, floats in the sky, where a forest, as single entity, bats, blows the sky. Yet, petal exudes dawn there exactly, not even gradually, for there is no memory. If there were not a contester, the dark blue indigo plum, black purple centered poppies are for nothing. Fractionators, wings, flock trees, bulk on stems, the whole a musical instrument, a stem, an appendage as the bass runner moving is an appendage, excuse me, as the bass runner moving is on appendages, hearing is the parts of these or the poppies from the current. That's the chapter, first chapter, the second chapter, celliform. The flu, F-L-E-W, the flu. The girls who flew and their action, that being passed, is single, singular. The girls who, lifting off, flew dispersed pink frocks in the hyperbolic, hyperbaric weight to, he pulls the onlookers of the parade with the red chela mitt, it pulls where being within the crowd's rim extracts the dark blue poppies. Extraction is once he moves on their lining. 
the contester, Cordate, coming to the crowd lining the streets as horses go by as a man would whose jaw making sores in his oxygenless flesh, his irradiated blood vessels having vanished, swim, breathing the pure oxygen in the diving bell there. Thus submerged, swimming oxygen in the diving bell breathing infuses his jaw with oxygen from which new blood vessels grow as small girls in pink dresses fly before the perambulator, disperse and flap across the street, decillient in pink flashes to flock behind bushes further on emerging shout in surprise at the pusher, a mother far from the contester, a man being before the crowd that is facing there the crowd's parade, so the contester is inside there mid inner side line, outside the crowd's lining, is between in their midst but alone standing outside them also his head outside the crowd, his arm in the red mitt, chela claw when pacing, lion-like, lion cell eyes, lidless, yet he's extending, exposing this cephalocordate, palm, red segmented lenticule reaches into the not even wavering, stalwart standing crowd. There, and his Korudix action from amidst them, and with the chela extracts the bunched, black-centered, dark blue purple poppies. Memory is here. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> A memorable sneeze. Memory is here. At once as they occur, the origin of the events but in their middles. So it, uh, most of the time, it has been impossible for me to read Leslie because what are you going to do about that? You know, so I, every time I re, so I, my, I have, my files are full of like failed, stupid Leslie uh, Scalapino imitation works because what are you going to do? You have to <laughs> write something, right? So I'll, I'll read you a couple pages of a work that I, I'm working on that may or may, never, may, or may not be finished sometime uh, based on the images of this book called The Strugglers, and I'll just read a couple pages. The Strugglers. The Strugglers with their claws reach in. They're snatched by, or they snatch, from the streaming crowds of people with their confused impulses, aggressive and violent, darkly arrayed, destruct and self-destruct blindly, without words for any of this, or knowledge, to reach with such claws, all innocent, brutally dumb, they extract hearts, blue hearts, what do they want them for? What do they do with them? The girls in their frocks, across the crowds or in them, as a parade, a wave, the crowd not as blood in blood vessels exposing parts to holes, but alone standing in their midst as victims of them, the red claws reaching into them, the girls' plumes as their red hearts, where the violent man reaching into the lining of the stomach eroded already by acidic emotions, action to swirl or choke, thrust down, burbling up, the girls bursting out of that in a pink blossom to extract the blue hearts from them. Memory in the brain as here, at, as once as they occur, the origin of the events, but in their middle, so in the brain, the occurrences as if they were occurring or now are or did occur in the middle, not crawling out to the end of them where one's self falls off or their stems at the beginning where there was before that then light, brutal, pressing, upward growth, then illuminated by their past parts, action and reaction at the same time, time that there is none events arising, the time of the pink swirl of the girls, their pain, which is also now recollected in tranquility, sharpness of the occurrence, pain that our hearts pulse with it, that it's the living pain, the moving blood, that it splashes into the middle of each memory. Seeming to flow in the reverse direction, picture of veins stained blue when the terrorists attack 
the cricket players, there's moon or heart in the lake, shining or reflected because of time's relentless spinning, that that's now, it, it was then included in it. My memory, all the spinning that occurs in that, stuffed into the basket high above the court at the buzzer shot, made madly at that time, as game played according to the mechanical clock, blood moving according to the moon in the lake, not that clock, there's charity. Organizations made for that, here recollected in tranquility as a feeling, an image vaguely occurring then, now, here, there, won't give money if there's no sympathy or resonance with that now, pulling near the cricketeers who lie dead in the crowd as crowds gore, their feeling for their own blood safely they can't see. Brought first fruits in baskets, waved them about and prostrated, burning their underwear in, in a giant conflagration, not at all organized. Instead, it went by feeling the images of that in a colorful world and, and the water all the time rising, inundating the roads, washing out the bridges and the cotton fields. There isn't talk of one time succeeding another as if moments lined up in succession as cars to a train or clouds stacked together in a darkened sky. Why assume looting then? For they passed between two mountains, which wouldn't actually have occurred in a distinctive past, but would have been in the past written as an occurrence in the past beyond the time of that present writing as pointing to a future that would have occurred when she will have been alive. Thank you. Armentrout. The last time I was here in the Bay Area was uh, early May, I think, and um, I went to see Leslie and Tom. It turned out to be about two weeks before Leslie died. Obviously, I knew she was ill, but I was amazed when I was there visiting her at how full of life she seemed. And I thought, well, maybe she won't die because she she didn't seem withdrawn into illness. She didn't seem, you, most many of you knew this, but she didn't seem overwhelmed or depressed. She seemed just as vivid and, and clear and radiant as she ever had, and talking enthusiastically about the project she was working on. Um, so I was surprised when I heard the news. So I'm going to read a bit of uh, a few sections from Green and Black to begin with, because she read this when she was in San Diego, where I live. Um, I guess it was about three years ago, and I remember her reading it. Of course, that means I remember her voice, which was so beautiful and distinctive. And that makes it hard to read her poems out loud, I think. But um, I'm going to give it a try. So Green and Black. Flowering gorges of black, clear river meeting in wide, separate, green, clear river road wake one at dawn only. Black river meeting green river only wakes one at dawn. Slight swaying the same of the figures there are dawn, one. Gorge coming down on not consuming communal only phenomenon, as at the black and the green river meeting, rushing at one communal as living place that was vast, set there on valleys, on night. To be always externally oriented, as desperate here in a crowd, people bowing, flocking to death to bow, Outsiders running to photograph those inner bowing are in it merely being that, catching those fleeing lightly. 
One's outside. One has to be held back from entering, flocking as itself one's inner. Flocking to death, surrounded by the shouting figures, is not distraction, necessarily, merely one's dawn only. Horns begin after rush motion is apprehension only, not in valleys, gorges, crowd, willingly rushes before sitting on by horns, night, speaking. Horns to begin after apprehension, not when crowds bowing is only apprehension. Black clear river meets green wide clear one, either sitting, not apprehension, sitting people preceded by horns. And then I'm going to read one little chapter of Horse Floats. A Woman Whirled. A woman whirled in a black robe, so not at present a girl. The latter wouldn't have any memories. One's physical body is disorder, as movement is. When one's shadow, when it's the sole action, it's being only outside. Practically present or continuous can't be disorder, not observed anyway, in that it resets itself to that level spirals. So even being still then is fractionation. When? The drones while cruising and killing citizens, nay insurgents, resistances, have sounds, they have the people running. Killing and cruising, there's no beginning. A subjectile isn't there to one who is speaking. Speaking is present always. So future is past, also sound coming after anyone speaking, being deaf. Then in the present, too, it is the side. Ahead, this subjectile, any word said, as any acting together, such as the hurdle where the workers hit their tummies on the swimming pool, during it, tea by beside, white wool flashing at his walking in, orry bud sticks, the blooming dogwoods will cover the grass that is a swaying emerald green, where the killing is present, going on in its wave. Thank you um, so much for coming out and for putting this together. <clears throat> I'm going to read a, a, a piece which uh, you could find in the beautiful Leslie uh, website, which has just been launched today. Tracy, thank you. Um, it's under the commentary section. There's uh, something called the Birkbeck tribute in England that Carol Watts, who teaches at Birkbeck College in London, put together. And this piece is there. It's call, called Still, Lesni Still Le Listening to Leslie Scalapino Reading. And it's about um, her reading and hearing her reading. And it's been so uh, you know, really great and wonderful to hear her voice in this room on the great sound system. It's, it's uh, uncannily brings her back into our presence. Now that Leslie Scalapino's physical presence in the world has too soon disappeared, we have only her words to remember her by, those written words that she left on the page, which we can still read and will read for a long time to come, and those she left us in the air, which we can still hear in recordings of her reading her own work, many of which are now at Penn Sound. To listen to the sound of Leslie's, Leslie reading her own work is an experience that one will not soon forget. At least that's been my own experience for years now, ever since I first heard her read. I remember one such occasion as if it were yesterday, perhaps because I wrote something as I was sitting there in the room at small press traffic, 
long before it moved to its present location at the college CCA uh, uh, campus out there on 8th, 18th Street. Was that it? The room of a bookstore lined with books. The noise of cars and buses passing in the street. The sound of Leslie's voice reading from her latest book. But not only the sound of her reading voice, also the sight of her speaking, reading presence. How she looked when she read. What she did with her hands. The right, was it holding the book, or was it on the podium? The left, with fingers extended, but somehow also clenched, gesturing from one exact moment to the next, as if to make the intensity of the words she was reading even more startling, more literally gripping. So it was both the sound of her speaking voice and the picture of her speaking those words of her poem that I'm thinking about now, which takes me back to thinking of the Latin poet Horace, who called poetry a speaking picture, ut pictora poesis. Probably not exactly what Horace meant by that, I know, since he was making a connection between poetry and painting. But there it is in any case, and useful perhaps here too, since it brings up that poem with photographs in crowd and not evening or light, Talisman 2002, just reissued in 2010 by her own O Books, which Leslie must have also been reading from that, from that night as small press traffic, judging from the reference in the piece I wrote there which was the third part of an essay on Leslie's work called Listening to Reading, which I later used for the title of Listening to Reading, the book, no doubt in homage to her. Here then is an ear eyewitness account of one person's experience of seeing and listening to Leslie reading her work in person. The person who is reading, Leslie Scalapino, stands at the end of a room in which other people have gathered to listen. There are cars going by in the street outside, and sometimes a bus, louder, pulling away from the curb. She is reading, and they are listening to, her words are embedded in this uh, piece, so I, I, th I think I'll raise my hand when I uh, come to her words. The bus stopping for them to get down, and the car is behind it. And the hand that is not holding the book is clenched but open, a representation of the violence of the couple crushing the steer's head, slitting its throat with the blood coming from the light red throat. And the flesh is a tension, muscles at the back of her neck and shoulders knotted in spite of what the drug might do to relax them. Dope in the ravines, wrinkled rivulets like cotton tufts in the sides of the ravines. Her voice as it goes up on faster, up a notch in pitch in the exact moment of it as the words that make the novel build. The, one who are the, the ones who are the audience are hearing the enactment and the cars coursing on the overpass by the cafe to it. The writing makes what is seen or known about through hearing or reading that much more present, as thinking makes it so on her part and theirs. Geared to this, writing an act one does as complement to being, completely involved at the place the mind sets in motion, that is. The one who is reading in the very hot weather here in late November when it is cold, coming to where another cab on the sidewalk had been left, crap, cracked up with a bus that's left beside it on the walk in the moonlight, though some of the people who are listening have removed their coats. If there is violence, one will notice more and more in what occurs, the beauty of it as fear. The man sitting over the corpse as a vigil is arising from him not having money, though it is done with care for someone passing away. The sound of this is a register the reader's voice approaches. 
When the page turns or she shifts the book from one hand to the other, the other one then becoming clenched, the pauses, interruptions of breath as a dash are as much a part of what is said as the words between them. Silence, that is, is a moment between the words. This is when the words think as what's being communicated and that of possessing a thing which isn't so, nor is there being communicating. The mind, in fact, the difference when that nature is open to it, writing as the picture of what happens. What she calls the comic book may be this, seeing this or remembering as it is real. The section, for, in for instance, she is reading of postcards with black and white photographs, captions written by hand. Instead of turning the page when it is done, she places the card on the chair as if to put one's thought out of mind, which then occurs in the frames of the comic book afterwards. Photographs of people standing or sitting, squatting in the water. Though grass is mentioned, it is not present. Some of the people one imagines as plants, parts of the body. The man has put his stem into her, on her swimming around. They are in the water she is writing as a picture of, his coming in her, swimming on her flat, on her, her flat, on the stem. This is not in the photograph, but in the mind, one that knows by means of what it thinks to write. The photograph becomes the trigger, whether it stands on the page as the picture when the feeling occurs, or cards piling up on the chair whose photographs have been cropped. The picture as this frame, and so the frame is ahead of what's there, it is not the same as looking at the event, but being in it. The writing she is reading being the event. Only the view, or that being, fragile. The book, or cards, she is reading in her hand is the voice, inside experience, and therefore rebelling. The other hand clenched, its fingers extended, because it doesn't hold the book. And so experience itself is convention, and we are outside of experience. The book can be seen, and its words can be heard in the air, in place. So this is what she thinks to say of the unfolding of phenomena, and we would stop it, have it come back in, if we were not that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Michael Cross, and I wanted to thank um, Lynn and Tom and Tracy for all of you done. It's um, amazing to share this stage with so many mentors and colleagues and friends and to, to share this evening thinking about Leslie's work. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of things. I brought a broadside that um, Laura Durbeck and myself um, collaborated on in tribute to Leslie that we made in December before we found out that she was sick. Um, and there are free copies up here if you'd like to take one. And Tom was generous enough to bring these bundles of Leslie's books, and all the proceeds could go to Poets in Need. So if you um, are interested in some of Leslie's books that you don't have, and, and it's, it's a really great um, opportunity to also, to also um, celebrate Poets in Need, which is a really interesting organization. I will never know how to adequately express my gratitude for Leslie Scalapino's poetry and person. Since her passing, I felt acutely how language fails those who love it most. Poets know, perhaps better than most, how little we really know about language, how when we most try to master it, it slips out of reach. I'm reminded of Zukovsky's claim in Bottom on Shakespeare that Shakespeare's plays are about his love of characters. Not the players on the stage, mind you, but the characters, the words, the letters, 
language. The real tragedy, according to Zukovsky, is Shakespeare's excessive love of language, that despite his unflagging commitment, it can never really do what he wants it to do. And then I think of Leslie's urgency at the end of her life to keep writing, to live through her work, to finish what she started. She claims in The Front Matter of Dead Souls, quote, a dialogue about love is utterly crucial to the remaking of the modern world in writing. And she's right, of course, and her work bears this out. While Zukovsky struggled to answer the riddle of language in A22 and A23 and 80 Flowers, the words can't love us back, Scalapino shows his error that writing, like other forms of love, is conflict, is process, is commitment, is attention, is lived experience. It loves, it loves us how it fails, it loves us in our readers, it loves us in our legacy, in our community, in what she called community as activity. It is precisely her commitment to activity, to language, to love, that leaves her reader speechless before her example. Though we haven't been very speechless tonight. <laughs> I've been trying inadequately to express this view in a critical project on Leslie's work that I started back in 2007. Um, we began an email interview in 2007 that we finished when Leslie passed. She actually answered her last question in her hospital bed. Um, and that work was coinciding with the critical project that I was doing. And I'm gonna read a couple of paragraphs from that, just a couple of short paragraphs. Um, and I'd like to read these paragraphs to think about what this new dialogue about love might be. For Scalapino, the relationship between events is the subject. It includes the subject, it constitutes the subject. And so the phenomenal world of nature, quote, is inseparable from one's conception and also does not come from oneself. The social relation is inherent conflict as oneself. The subject in is the site of conflict between mine action and the phenomenal world, the very horizon line or collapsing rim of observation in which, quote, the social unit is disintegrating. The subject suffers this conflict of forms, which includes, of course, the provisional form of subjectivity, where the images of reality are eliminated on the horizon line of the present. And I should mention that this chapter is thinking through um, Duncan's notion of the, the, the curtain or the veil in the HD book and how Leslie's thinking about Duncan and um, the way that Leslie moves between prehension and apprehension and comprehension, that there's a difference between those three things in Leslie's work. We might call this event horizon the conflict of scrutiny as a condition of writing. The rim of observation, the page is where time is flattened and the movement between prehension and apprehension becomes difficult to ascertain. For Scalapino, quote, rebelling is on the rim where irreconcilable relations are flattened to be one while maintaining their conflict, a conflict that's contained in her person. The event horizon is an actively moving border, annihilating comprehension through the, quote, visual field that is opened and at the same time narrowed to its sky horizon as concentration. The writing makes time inoperative. As the past is relegated to the forms of myth and the future is nothing but the projection of desire. One can only experience phenomena in good faith through the continuous present where the subject becomes the interface of experience and the page becomes the event horizon of possibility. Perception, writing, subjectivity itself are all phenomena that must be held accountable to the same level of scrutiny. Any attempt to occupy the present is an experience of pure negativity as one endlessly negates forms as they present themselves. One's poetry must also negate itself in real time to be real time, which is perhaps the primary difficulty of, for readers of Scalapino's work. Not only will the writer occupy that precarious zone of indeterminacy that is the rim of observation, but the reader too must enter into this tarry with the negative, as Hegel would say. 
The moment of reading is its own rim of observation where the poem's content and the words on the page take shape like any other prehensor. Rather than represent the world, Scalopino's poetry occupies the movement of thought while turning in on itself as phenomena. And the reader finds herself, too, as a moment of both relation and negation. This, for Leslie Scalapino, is the beginning of a dialogue about love. Thanks. So I'm here as myself this time. Um, I'm really honored to be here, and as I, I look around the room, I can see so many, um, so many of my teachers, not only in the classroom, but also on the page, in your writing, in your published works, um, in your performances, uh, in impromptu conversations that we have at events, and probably mostly the way that you live your lives and the, the things that you hold dear. Um, I'm sure that this is something that will go on. Um, this is what Leslie was for me. She was a really powerful mentor. I met her in 1997, and as, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about tonight, I was thinking about this reading where I met her at New College, and as Stephen was talking, I was thinking that maybe I actually met her at the very same reading that he was taking notes at. Um, it was, uh, Small Press Traffic was hosted in uh, a building at the college at that time. And I remember not knowing anything about Leslie. I had never read her work. I didn't know who she was. Um, and I just decided to attend the reading and, and find out. Um, it was an amazing experience for me. And I remember it vividly, very much in the way that uh, Stephen described it, um, the way that she held her hand, the sound of her voice, the cadence of her speaking the quality of attention that she gave when she read, focused attention, um, all of those things uh, are firmly fixed in my, my memory of her. Um, like um, Tracy, I, I, that was about 14 years ago, and I was thinking about, there are so many of you in this room that have known Leslie for much longer than that, and I was thinking why that's important to me, and I, so I did the math, and I figured out that that's probably a third of my lifetime, and that's probably a third of her lifetime, so at this point for us, um, that's, that's something that's very significant in terms of our, our development as artists. Um, so among the many threads of resonance uh, that I found with Leslie's work, including her unyielding approach to language and her, um, her approach to multidisciplinary forms of writing. One of the strong threads for me was our shared interest in the literary exploration of the Buddhist principles of duality and impermanence. And I find this appearing again and again in her work. Um, I see it in the, the word choices that she makes, the phrasing, line breaks, topics, visual, visual page composition, and the relational dynamics within each piece, constantly highlighting was what was once there and then immediately not there, or is this, but is rather that again at the same time, in no time, all time, and nothing. There are two, two books that I was looking at where I noticed this, and one is the Tango, which is this really lovely large format book, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. Um, the other, which I found was interesting, was a very small format book, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. <laughs> is subjective. The man starving, dying, lying in garbage, there not being black dawn, no, not anyway, that is, anywhere, or. Subjunctive is only social, both. Then, when alive, subjunctive. Black dawn isn't, so it has to pass, both. To ignore one's shape, events, so, it goes on wildly, and, anyway. Magnolia buds, that haven't opened. Subjectivity, language only, both. Words, black dawn as shape, instance that has no other occurrence, 
which is their shape and their conceptual shape, to subordinate magnolia buds. That is real time, both. Not for there to be magnolia bud not opened, bud displacing in lineage, both. Single is trees, buds there, as only ones social at the same time. A given in space, displace blossoming trees. People's behavior being blossoming trees, per se, just as that, and the action of it, their behavior, in the trees blossoming prior, which is separate, soul. Bound as split, ones, to conception of change as, or in, behavior, that was not when a child, rather than in blossoming trees, everywhere, as ground, is an ocean here. So split is that only, ocean, in blossoming trees. In fact, has to be to change people's behavior, ones as soul. In fact, itself isn't then. Change in blossoming trees occurring prior to trees, then blossoming trees being social only. The moon is socially based as emotion is, so it would be itself. A given in space, displace blossoming trees. On experience, so one's isn't is obliterated by the referring place this to, seeing at all is social, is blossoming trees. Or when one's outside there, so there's moon there, as outside is the only existing both. Seeing the man starving, lying in garbage, yet to conceptually place the site only in relation to space, to foreground and background, or future simply, to buildings is not to iterate those as conditions present. His dying is to be not in relation to space or to conjecture. It's not to be that, as blossoming trees are one's subjectivity, language, there. Just oneself being roses only, Roses only, people in speaking or in their limbs being that to each other also. Bound as split ones to conce conception of change as or in behavior. That was not when a child so split is that only. Ocean in blossoming trees, in fact, has to be change people's behavior, ones as soul. Standing, wall, wall, rose, and rose flowers, social, both. Conceptually, as of dropping, being, or a view in space, as dropping out, is not using language here either, slow, which is one walking so slow that out traces, eludes them. To walk so slowly as not to be there with them at all, who are social only, or out tracing them ahead neither, yet one sight at a time retains, a sight itself retains outside, and sight is only separate from language or movement. As dropping out low vertical, night is both with no people, but images seen at once left there, no seeing either, is wild moon in day. A left there as left leg, the viewer is in a separate place from what they see at the moment, always 
the viewer is they both running wall is space living in the subjunctive social both is space it's fear propelled isn't in one who's in it or when it's in one maybe isn't in the others existing there seeing in it oneself only as not coming from them but in one only then is then freely the relation of suffering at all to space so it isn't in black night this other sees fear coming from others only there so acts as fear in her which is to become or hurt them she's in black night subjunctive no there there's only that one's there behavior in relation to space interpreted everyone is turned to be one only as to rush up and there is nothing but that one's fragile in relation to them only said to be the occurrence then different from to rush up to them and instant is only ones such as fear not from them there is not lineage social outside there or night can't be in night thank you Well, it's wonderful to hear everybody uh, and, and haunting the halls here tonight. Uh, um, I've learned from Michael McClure that it's possible to use the women's bathroom <laughs> <laughs> on the third floor, which had I known would have solved uh, unprevented, uh, etc. <laughs> It's interesting, uh, having uh, last uh, sort of been here for some time in the spring of 1970, and Leslie Scalopino also uh, was in this building for a period, and her father Robert, of course, taught at Berkeley for many years. Um, it's interesting to think in the context of, of Lynn Higinian's um, autobiographical, collective autobiographical account in the Grand Piano 10, which has just come out, uh, which is about the struggles of, of persons such as herself and to exist in, in the uh, public university for purposes of, of education. Uh, um, that our presence here tonight um, uh, is not unakin to what was going on in, in the spring of 1970. That is, uh, persons attempting to reoccupy a public space for public purposes, for purposes of education, except it's a little more active, um, especially for those of us who have wandered about tonight, than a sit-in. Uh, would be uh, in itself, although that has potential too. So I thank Lynn and Rosa and Tom very much for this occasion, and let us be an example to all of us um, um, dundering aged persons. Uh, we can come to the podium and speak too. We can exist in this room, and uh, as long as uh, the lights are on, which they seem to be, uh, we don't really need anything more than our desire to learn. So that being that, um, <laughs> This is a piece that I wrote shortly after Leslie died. Uh, I thought of it at that time as being a very personal statement. 
Then it appeared in public in, in the uh, forum that uh, Steve mentioned at Birkbeck College in London, way over there. And now uh, I read it to you uh, with some, in, in, in a sense of quandary. I mean, instead of an animal. Oh, this is a title um, as one we will recognize uh, by Leslie Scalapino with drawings by Diana Sophia, Berkeley, California, Cloud Marauder Press, 1978. Uh, there was a picture of it uh, that Conrad put up earlier as uh, in the long sequence of Leslie's books. Instead of an animal for Leslie Scalapino. Instead of an animal would be what? Uh, what then? A apparently human in this day and age with Tarquin's ravaging stride, scarifying earth, as she documents? A flat beast made out of letters over many years, doggedly pursuing its career in letters during sleep and equally while eating early on in the late 1970s, almost always there at every reading and lecture, willing herself onto the scene or madcap commentator on life's ills, miracles, which the wind blows up. Well, this is all about what there might be instead of an animal. Rather, a voluble, enthusiastic, and silent person, apparently beyond talk, with a developing idea in her head, who lived within a skull from which two eyes glowed and shone from within an internal delay of which she speaks in her delay rose, from which a thinking perception ventured forth with words to make happen what these words make happen. A slow developing smile with which she bathes the whole world completely. A delightful, disarming uproar, guffaw. A thing for sumo wrestling, wrestlers. <laughs> a pain in the neck again. A wonderful writer whose command of syntax and ability to summon visions of transcendental, everyday landscapes and persons with thought processes and perceptions running around in the minds of her actual readers are more than commonplace, almost unmatched. The author of Defoe and her adventures has carried on in the crime novels and in the being of Detective Grace Abe, where sleepwalking, hyperactive comic book characters determine and meet their fates in the lurid color cityscapes of ancient American radio drama. The author, with Lynn, Hizit, Lynn Higinian, of Sight, which I'm honored to say included a very generous touch of the hat to me. <laughs> the author and photographer of the tango with Marina Adams, which I raved about in my preface, who wrote a spirited introduction incorporated into the inside covers of my black box, the first O Books book, actually it wasn't, in which she asserted, I drew letters as if from the other side of the paper. Extravagant muscular musculature type exploratory syntax mixed with plus maddening, maddeningly non-referential pronouns like that. I compiled a whole long list of uses of that, a really interesting bottomless word after learning, during, learning to read Leslie's Defoe as a work, but nothing came of it. All this exploding vigor of dreamy real dream figures thinking abounding held in place by a strange rigor of controlled ongoing formal structural invention. And what was her system for recurrences? How did she know where they went? when they were to occur, and what did they mean? <laughs> that there are these recurrences, and what are they up to in the ongoing presentation of the text? 
Some of the sexiest writing you're likely to come across in poetry, <laughs> compounding her characteristic delay with tuned recurrences, phrases for rhythms of extended copulation. For example, incorporating her invention of the word stem, which was mentioned. <laughs> For the male sex organ, integrating human biology with that of the plant kingdom and wider reverberating life on Earth during the act of love. A stern foe, I'm sure. Not for me, ordinarily, because we are almost always friends, differentiated cousins, for those lamb-basted sorts who were her foes, so that heinous public figures and sometimes personal associates, writers and critics, subtly altered, would find themselves skewered in public in her next book for their perceived misdeeds. We went on one date way back when. <laughs> I talked a lot as I drove, and Leslie said less and less, and then nothing as I talked the more. <laughs> there was all the way back. We drove home in silence and parted completely amicably. A dollar bill like they used to make them. I'm going to do this, which Steve did. A dollar bill like they used to make them. A buffalo head nickel shines. A very American inscrutable patented system for making the whole thing go round. Sometime toward the millennium, one could sense, as with Creeley dancing to Crosby, Stills, and Nash in front of the fireplace in that stone house in Anasquam in the summer of 1969, was it? The relentless engendering agency of physical language process itself entered into as blood beckoning entrance into inner imagination bloodstream, such that, in awe of what I could feel her doing, becoming, I wrote immediately, warning Leslie to rest at times, so that she not be devoured by the powers of poetry she was tapping into in the process of tr transforming herself into a character in her own ongoing melodrama. And then she was devoured later by the external cancer that ate her alive. Another Jean d'Arc, an angel of sorts, acting out her passion out there on the macadam who took a stand in public by organizing and participating in readings and publishing anthologies championing just causes. The publisher with Tom White over many years of old books with its mission of making books. In the beginning, Leslie did much of the production work, celebrating especially the developing work of younger experimental unknown writers. Boy, did she whop me that one time I managed to say, oh, press. <laughs> sitting on their front steps after, sitting on their front steps after our deferred appointment this past May, while Leslie upstairs rested, slept. I had never been to the new house on Presley Way. And Leslie was a crooner, too. She certainly did develop a forceful reading style. When does one begin the sleep of death or a baby, the dream of life? But so much suffering, my back, etc., as Creeley would say and did say often, Robert Creeley was one of the ardent uh, champions of Leslie's work. He saw it immediately. And uh, that was, uh, I thought, quite extraordinary. As Creeley would say and did say often, each one is one, consummatum est. Each life assumes its form, each shape, its shape. That's it. It is. It's over. That says it all. That's that. That's Leslie for me, always. <laughs> My same one cousin in the practice of poetry, my successor, as I used to embarrassingly, fondly, grandly claim her to be to myself, knew everything I knew and was already carrying on ahead otherwise. I wrote her in February after the diagnosis at, at the beginning of her chemo, 
You're the one. She wrote back that she dreamt of me drawing blue and green letters in the ocean. Instead of an animal, Leslie Scalpino. So uh, after that, I wanted to read, since nobody else has been so uh, gauche and <laughs> dumb to do this, everybody had exchanges. I wanted to read some excerpts of letters that we had back and forth last spring, February 12, 2010. Dear Leslie, I called right to send you my love as always. Steve told me something of it, and then voicemail back from Tom said not to call your home because doctors were calling and that you'd call me. Please do. That's a wonderful song. Chaka knows bees and bees. Is it Chaka? 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 Chaka. Chaka knows bees and bees. Did you sing it to the Chaka? Sort of thing, of course, I would do. Finally, preoccupied with the Agner, and for so many years it's been, I'm sorry to have been out of touch. Finally, you said, when I called that once a while ago. Got round to reading Delay Rose in your green integer book by its sticker I must have found in Moe's when, three years ago? New to me. Did you read it? Or part at the Creeley Memorial at UC USF? Anyway, from his dying with the whole and in a way, your whole work, anyway, this long poem balanced between R.C. and Jackson McClough. I love the Elands. What is Mazarin? And the intestines in their eyelids. And the plum. As a plum, oneself upright. Such an eye-opener to me as a kid to find myself portrayed in being and time as Dasein, their being, thrown into existence as ecstatic project and furf. All was already being toward death. Yet a person's living to die, as you say, to be alive in that split, not only in Creeley, the Gemini, and you, of words running, trying to catch up with whatever's occurring, what words are saying. Each one of us is between birth and death. What a trip, eh? And with that wonderful picture of you on the cover, there you are, Leslie. So the daffodils, plum trees, blooming like crazy from the rain in springtime hereabouts, Broke my rib, kid elbowed, elbowed me playing basketball. I'm too old for that down at the school, I wrote. So I'll carry my rib cage to the bathroom. <laughs> if you've ever been recovering from rib damage, you'll understand that. <sighs> Susie was here on one of our visits back and forth. When will we live together? Recently, I had my hand on her ribs in bed and declared, realized, I was born from your rib. <laughs> Please call me when you can, and if you want to, you could see here some parts of what I've been up to, and so on, love to you. And Tom, voice message from Leslie Scalpino, February 17, 2010. Um, hi, Bob. This is Leslie. I'm calling around. Gosh, I don't know what time it is. Quarter after 12. I'm on a Wednesday. So I just wanted to thank you very much for the packet you sent, which was uh, this letter and little conversation called Farming the Words. The book in your lovely letter, and I do appreciate it very much. It's been very hard for me to talk on the telephone, and truly, there have been many doctors and appointments and needles being stuck in me. Laughs, that's what Norman, that's the laugh that Norman indicated. Anyway, I've gotten into a clinical trial, which is good, and I'm taking an experimental drug. I got into the wing of the clinical trial that gives me the experimental drug as well as the conventional treatment. So this may, if I'm lucky, extend my life somewhat, but not save it as they keep emphasizing. 
Um, anyway, I appreciate hearing from you, and we're going to take a little drive this afternoon because some friends from New York came. But I'll try and call you towards evening, and um, if I can't get you tomorrow, I have a big chemo day, so it won't be able to deal with anything tomorrow. But maybe the next day, and if I don't reach you, today I'll give you another call. Bye-bye. February 17, 2010. Dear Leslie, thanks for your voice message. Today is the big chemo day. You're the one. I saw that, certainly by the time of Defoe. Remember that long critical appreciation you wouldn't let me publish because it was about 60% quotation, and thus a kind of fucked up, selected Defoe? And then, at about the same time, there was that very extensive compilation, invention, investigation of uses of the word that, also unpublished. Remember when there used to be copyright protection? which was provoked by encountering your marvelous, mysterious uses of what initially seemed a pronoun without an antecedent. To see if one might establish a range of reference for and thus partially define the word in practice. I mean, the one, après moi, madame, who knew what I had learned from reading, running into certain practitioners in the field, and from my own writing, and who would go on to do the work to be done, and so you have. Congratulations. Open praise is unlike me. I remember the time I warned you when I could feel you getting sucked in the vortex of the power of the operation of the ongoingness of languaging, which was kind of scarily demonstrated to me one night. Well, that's the narrative about Creeley. Not to be devoured by words. And now it seems it's the course of life itself which is eating, eating us up. And let's see, there was a note, uh, huh. There was, a, let's see, not to read all of this. Hi, Leslie, April 24th. I'm just writing to say hello and send you my love. Susie is here shepherding through me, shepherding me through my first cataract surgery lens replacement for right eye, which happened last Monday, and its aftermath. Things are kind of blurry, but starting to resolve, I guess, hope. And we've been thinking of you. Charles Bernstein told me the cancer had been set back, which is good, of course, and that they're coming to stay with you and Tom May 10th. I'll see you in connection with their visit, if not before. Please write me or call whenever you feel so inclined. I'm not supposed to run to raise blood. I'm not supposed to run to raise blood pressure for a time, to let the lens set in there. But we've been walking everywhere. This aft going back up on Ridge, coming off Mount Tam. Do you know that road in State Park they call rather grandly Ridgecrest Boulevard, where spring flowers all over the place are in profusion now, all sorts of trails through the grass up there? Uh, and then uh, back from Leslie, I remember some ridge or mountainside hiking there, but can't remember its name. I didn't know about the eye condition. Good to have it over with and healing. There are expert doctors with that condition, Bob. Oh, with that, with that, there are expert doctors with that operation. Bob, I had a dream about you and was meaning to write you, to tell you. I dreamt that you were writing the words red and green in the actual ocean, the huge billowing Pacific. You were painting them as you do your poems, so the word red showed up red and the word green, I can't remember whether the, these words were capitalized, showed up green. It was extremely beautiful. There was no sound to the dream, only you drawing in the whole ocean. Actually, a wonderful dream. I'm doing okay, but have an infection in my leg or something that won't heal, even with daily infusions of antibiotics. So this is very painful and very hard to walk. Plus, getting sick all the time from the chemo, but I'm happy to alive and strive to continue as such. Love, Leslie. I realize I'm going on for a long time and we'll try to speed it up, but they told me when I, at the Larry Eigner event, that I didn't talk enough, so 
you're getting published and punished instead. This is a notebook beginning uh, June 4th, 2010. And let's see, windy today, tonight. Windy eucalypts. Windy eucalypts. Die as a man. Instead of a crawfish, crayfish. But then must possibly also uh, to be released uh, from one's actual condition and to die into some other life. The evening bent over walk, rubbing eyes, I sneeze. That's for Simone, who is gone. Stars out tonight. Right blue green ocean. So I took that letter as a kind of a task, except here blue is green and green is blue. Right blue green ocean. My life a breeze. <laughs> A noble earthquake, that's a quotation. I'll scrub your bottom, you brush my teeth. Watering garden, I want to read books. Leslie gave me a rose. Oh, this is after the uh, ceremony at Green Gulch. Uh, I like the uh, bell outside, particularly. And uh, Joanne Kiger and I were wandering around out there. And there was a bell here when we began, if you noted from the Campanile, inevitably. Uh, and there was also the mention of Rose in the first thing that Leslie read. Leslie gave. So I came back from the ceremony, and I went out back and looked in the garden, and there was a rose. Uh, and I thought, oh, I look all the time at different things. Where did that come from? Uh, that's too soon. I look out there all the time. And there it was, a big rose, big red rose in the backyard. Where did it come from? Leslie gave me a rose. I decided Leslie gave it to me. Leslie gave me a rose from the garden itself. Oh, I, I realized that Leslie didn't really give me the rose because Leslie was dead. And the garden gave me the rose. <coughs> Leslie gave me a rose from the garden itself. Oh, well and good. That's a funny thing to say. Everything is all, yeah, it's all well and good, but you know, there's all this, uh, you know, pain and suffering and so on. Oh, and here's a quotation from Robert Creeley, um, which I didn't have room to write in full. Um, the, the original was, and it's from Pieces, it's, here I am, there you are. But I, I didn't have room to, to, to write the rest of it. So what I ended up writing was, here I am, there you. And uh, that seems to happen uh, often enough. <laughs> OK, that's enough of that. Sorry to go on for so long. from the Dihedron's Gazelle Dihedral Zoom. Um, this work was written by leafing through Random House Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, choosing words at random by process of Alexia, not as mental disorder, but as word blindness, 
trance-like stream overriding meaning, choice, and inhibition, the intention to bring about an unknown future was offset by this action of Alexia making, as it happened, sensual exquisite corpses, leading to the discovery that there isn't any future, isn't even any present. Such an exquisite corpse, red, is in an instant, yet not even in a present. Outside's events unite, gluing to each other a single object. That which had already existed is by chance. I'm going to read kind of um, here and there throughout the second half of the work. But this is representative of the way it is, even if I were reading pieces that were right next to each other. So it's not that it's founded on plot, though it does have characters that were generated by words coming up, such as the Bocock uh, uh, becomes a character suddenly and then disappears. And some of the characters remained, like the base runner and the dead. Gazelle. Gazelle dihedrons are those that move fast forward, seen as only frontal spine slats of rib cage zooming to one, almost as if omitting space. Whereas sides dihedral planes, sequential ones, side views of gelatinoids, organs hanging, verticals bordered by pink flesh rim around the figure, are not seen to move but from one place suddenly appear somewhere else. Grura forms are drawn to the dihedrons, visible whole cranes, coots, rails fly to and fro in front of the base runner. The Grura forms just arise. V. Though the water was warm enough, the middle of the octopus sucking her hump, when she came on her full frontal from the avatar, applied on her lying in the ocean, she would see the northern lights in vast stripes there, appeared also in the bands, the stripes of lights, the dihedrons, sides still at first, then appearing elsewhere suddenly, appeared elsewhere, though they weren't seen to move, and the gazelle dihedral zoom frontals. They streamed the lights. Opposite climbs are not opposing. The base runner running after the vision of the gel childs, freezing, retreating, and freezing. He was seeking to save it, was, he was, in running, warned off by seeing the dihedrons gathering at the sides of the blowing, frozen waste lake, their open sides, the halves of hearts, livers, lungs, in exquisite gels, held open in them, in the opened flesh rooms, glitter in the emerald dark. Day is night. Her gold aureole, the outsider to staffers, appears after a while, is not in her child life, outside, or is, unseen, insofar as it is oral, heard, spoken, by others or her, the gold aureole floating above her head is in her humorous actions where it is radiant. Daffing tortoise, cylinder light continues beside her, emerging from the ocean where the small eye in crinkled pink folds rimmed, as of an elephant eye, weak at the keyhole, Cheney's pink crenellated sack for the eye is in its flesh case there, that of the man who'd lay bomblets to be picked up by children, glowers looking like flowers explode to torture, tortured, altered here. Then his weak small eye in mid-seeing appears dim, is in one's palm, not extracted from Cheney. His eye in him too is dim not intervening. One's own eye is weak to see. Mm -hmm. 
motor movement. A cerulean warbler, sheathed as the outsider, never seen one, seriferous in the dusk, yellow sun falling. It is not as if a rainbow spread or people showed a tie to secret bloody war through a few people who, when seen, are covered with sermons, dead, arising from their nature, like their fruit, like that's in relation to days appearing to unfold. That's not in from war. Surely the boy is sleeping, who is dead on the engine of the car, that also starts and dies, is in that interior sink with, as of days, thin, palpable appearing, or only being there, but moving, not sequential, where they appear in order to be, and Sir, Sir Argorite, horn, silver, those disaphic, taken apart from sensation, touch, or seeing, become disaphic by derangement of emotion driven in and out on itself. Those walk or sing, motor movements known to them as tactile, everything unknown by being separated from themselves as by the constant deranging of the chrysanthemum. They become multiple mysterious hydrangeas with a hawk hovering on the children, strays also eating elephant ears in front of the bakery that appear amber electrums in the falling vast sun, a remnant of seeing that in their hands Electra navigational system, the coincidence of two radio signals, the pastries, the elephant ears held in their hands here that are not live. Thank you. <laughs> Is that 15 minutes? 23? Oh, <laughs> that was that is an amazing text. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, all the things that you folded into it. Yeah, it's, it's I think it's my best text. It's actually. it's pretty incredible. It's my it's my latest thing. I just finished it. What's it called? The dihedron gazelle dihedron. So what is disaphic? Without sensation, apart from no senses. But it's without, they have, none of the people have sensation, but while they're having it intensely, which the text is supposed to be the sensation. Thanks to all who contributed to this uh, event. Thanks to Leslie Scalapino for all she gave us. Um, drive home safely. <laughs>